Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency and Money Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. I'm Tony Guerra, pharmacist and publisher, bringing you help succeeding in your career, health, and wealth before, during, and after residency. You can sign up for the email list at pharmacyresidencypodcast.com to get your free LOI template or get editing help working one-on-one with me at residency.teachable.com. Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast. Remember the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Just a reminder that uh, most of these are videos, so if you want to go to Tony D on YouTube, uh, you can find it there, uh, or you can uh, kind of turn your, your phone in such a way that you can see it, uh, but a little bit easier to use on like a, a laptop or something like that for something like today's uh, episode. So what I first wanted to do was talk a little bit about um, where my template is. People email me, hey, can I get your template? Where's it at? Um, you can either go from the video or you can just go right to my site, but uh, there's a uh, residency letter of intent template hyphen how to properly use it uh, is the video on Tony PharmD. And it was uh, four years ago that I, I did that and uh, it's gotten 10,000 views since and almost 100 people liked it. <laughs> That's a little disappointing that uh, I know people don't don't really click that much, but um. <clears throat> Uh, that's where you can find it, and I'm guessing that most people just clicked on the link and, and kind of went to get the template. Uh, but that's where you can find it. And then if you just want to go to residency.teachable.com forward slash P forward slash extreme LOI, uh, you just scroll all the way down to uh, where it says letter of intent, template, video, and audio guides, and you just go to the template and video. Uh, the real value with the course is, is that I um, do some uh, revisions for you, uh, and that usually happens in about 24 hours. So uh, you just basically send me your LOI, in 24 hours I will send it back uh, to you and revised, and you can have that peace of mind that you're started, ready to go. Um, but uh, again, I give you a complete, you know, it's done. Like you, you don't need to, to revise it, and I actually would recommend against revising it. Um, <clears throat> but then you can do your second one, I'll revise your second, uh, and then you'll know how to do it from there. Uh, but what somebody asked me was, well, I, can you look at my LOI and tell me if it's good? Well, I can give you some things that'll tell you if it's sort of good. Um, the one thing, uh, this was put out by the ISHP, which was like the Illinois Chicago Hospital Pharmacist something or other. And they, to be fair, they have uh, like three different examples. But this first example was really telling because I, I copied and pasted it into what's called a flesh Kincaid calculator. And it tells you what grade level it is. And that one was between eighth and ninth grade reading level. That's not where you want to be. Uh, you want to be right here at college. Uh, you may want to be 10th to 12th grade high school. That's okay. Uh, because that means that your writing is clear. Uh, it's not necessarily better to be higher. And I actually would think that you're, if you're a college graduate, uh, that might be too high uh, because it means that there might not be quite as much clarity. So it doesn't matter really, you know, 10th grade to college graduate. But I assure you, you, you don't want to be in this eighth, this eighth grade camp. Uh, with your letter of intent. So one quick way to do it is the the goodcalculators.com forward slash flesh hyphen Kincaid hyphen calculator. That's one way. Another thing a lot of people are using are are Grammarly and you start off with a score like 77 and you go from there and then you see you know what what your score is and that kind of gives you a score too. So what does this have to do with the whole uh, what are your odds of matching? Well if you're sending in something that is an eighth grade writing with a 77 Grammarly score, well, your odds are going to be a lot lower than the average. And if you send it with better, uh, that's the whole point is to to gain an advantage. uh, And then you're in a much better shape. So what I want to do is I want to go over the stats with you and kind of show you um, how the stats sort of work and sort of don't work. So let's first look at the trend, which is um, the number of positions has continued to go up. And since 2014, where there were 3,394, and now there's 5,256 in 2023. So uh, let's say 3,000 to 5,000, right? So we're just to work in whole numbers, okay? Now, there were about 5,000 people that wanted residencies when there were only 3,000. But there are now 6,000 people when there are only 5,000. So the gap has 
narrowed significantly. If we look at a gap here, it's about 2,000 people between how many want it and how many are available in terms of positions. And that gap has narrowed a lot uh, to the point that we are now between, it was uh, 6,019 and 5,256. So less than 1,000 spots from almost 2,000. And so it's a lot easier to get a residency, but the thing that you can do now is now you can upgrade your residency. What, you want me to work two, you want me to work 12 days and then have two off? No, I don't think so. I appreciate it, but I'm gonna go with this other residency that uh, is much more interested in my you know, mental health and uh, having a normal, um, you know, state of mind during residency where I'm not burnt out by the third month, right? Or, you know, I appreciate that offer, but, you know, we have had inflation over the past couple of years, and uh, I'm going to take this one that is an equivalent residency for the 15000 more, but I appreciate your offer. And so the nice thing is, is that now you're at the point where you can start upgrading and getting residencies that are closer to you, paying more, better quality of life. Uh, and more likely to get you into the job that you want. But you still have to do the work. Remember, you're still making an argument that someone should pay you this 50 or 60 or $70,000. And to do that, uh, the letter of intent, of course, has to be effective, and that, that's where I come in with that stuff. But let's just look at the numbers and see you know, where we're at and, and what numbers are right and wrong. Um, so let's actually take a look at the the um, <clears throat> the combined here because this is the number everybody uh, tends to look at, and uh, it's unfortunate that people will say something like, "Oh, it's a little over eighty percent chance that you're going to get a residency." Let's clarify what that actually is. So the combined stats for the applicants is that when you began at the number of fifty-seven fifty-four, that's who registered for the match. 743 withdrew or didn't return any rankings. Most of those people did not get an interview. But you can see that's not really a ton of people. It's only like 12, 13% that didn't get an interview. Great, all right. But are they getting interviews at places they really want? Okay, so that's, that's really the thing. So when we get to the match, we're, we're at 5011. So that 82% is 4099 divided by 5011 not divided by 5754. So I just want to make clear that, that that if you're going from where we are right now, where we're just starting things out, well, now we're, we're really talking about somebody that's at 4099 divided by 5754, right? So you're talking about 71%. You say, well, that's still not bad, three out of four. Well, yes and no. The problem with residency is timing. You are going to get your answer in March. Well, let's talk about the jobs that are out there. Let's say you don't get a residency, or let's say you go into phase two, which goes into April, right? Which jobs do you think get picked up first, right? The best jobs. And so the last thing you want is to be scrambling at the end of graduation where you're sitting there like, well, mom and dad, I appreciate you letting me stay home with you guys for another couple of months as I kind of figure things out. Because unfortunately, this whole residency thing is kind of a once a year thing, one and done. Uh, well, sort of a, a backup with phase two. So uh, what I want you to do is, is take it very seriously that you are kind of going all in whether you are or not. Though some of you are smart enough to have job offers lined up just in case uh, you don't do it. And, and I know that there's um, uh, people that, that say, oh, you shouldn't do that. That's not fair to the, the company and, and so on. Um, but uh, you really want to do what's best for you. And having a job when you graduate, especially if you have student debt, uh, is an important piece. So anyway, the, the whole odds of it is around 82% after you're talking about who's participating in the match. But that isn't fair to say because what you do next and what's critical is that you go to your college. And there's a list by college of how many matched and how many got an interview. <clears throat> so, or how many became active with the list basically getting an interview. So when you look at the first column registered, let's talk about Auburn. So only five people either just took a job, decided not to interview, didn't get an interview and so forth out of those 69 people, okay? Then out of those 69, 
um, we had the 64, and of those, 56 matched. So when you're looking at a, a number and you're saying, okay, well, how good is Auburn at getting a match? You know, you're looking at almost 88%, right? But if you're starting from the beginning, you know, you're saying, okay, well, those people that started out, you're at 81%. But still, four out of five, that's a reasonable amount, though it's still lagging behind medical school by over 10%. And then there's the eight that didn't match. And I will tell you, a lot of times, those eight, and you're like, oh my gosh, what did they do wrong? Um, sometimes it's just that through the process of applying for residency, uh, those eight people might have realized and they did it through their body language and, and all of that, that, yeah, you know, I just, I, I'm, I, my, my words are saying I want to be a resident, but my, you know, body tone and all, or my, um, you know, uh, body language and all of that is, is really saying that I, I don't think this is for me. It's something that was expected and so on. And so that's where you kind of go first. So the, the blanket is it's about 70, a little over 70% from the start, a little over 80% when you talk generally, and then you narrow down to your school and you say, okay, well, you know, based on that, you know, in my school, what does it, you know, go down to? But now this number can go all the way down to around 12 and a half percent. So we took 80 as, you know, was, was the average. But um, if you look at individual schools, you're like, well, wow, how could a school be so far below the mean? And this is something that doesn't show up on the matrices, um, which is, you know, should, should we take this person for uh, a residency? But what I can tell you is that RPDs still have a boss. And RPDs do not want to end up with a lot of people who don't pass the NAPLEX and don't pass the MPJE. Now, you say, well, it, it shouldn't matter, right? We're, we're just judging the person. But there is no way that you can tell me that if this applicant who comes from a school that has a NAPLEX pass rate of 21% and this person that has a NAPLEX pass rate of 93%, that if given on equal ground, that the RPD would go, you know what, you know, well, I mean, they're about even, so I'll take the one that has a one in five chance of passing the NAPLEX versus the person that is over nine times out of 10 going to pass the NAPLEX. I, I can't, you just can't do that. That's actually irresponsible, right? Because not only are you affecting you as the RPD, you're also affecting the other residents in that they are going to have to pick up your shifts. They're going to have to pick up the work that you're supposed to do. And at that pass rate, the question is, is there a point where they actually can't pass it at all? Are you going to have to disqualify them after, you know, that point where, you know, you're going to miss too much residency. You never became a pharmacist. We're going to have to let you go, right? That place could have been given to somebody else. And then we have to take the MPJE into account. Same thing. You know, you're looking on a page and you say somebody that has a 96% pass rate at their school and you see somebody that has a 56% pass rate. Is it on the, the grid, you know, in terms of what are the things that we're judging you for? No. But when it comes down to it and when it comes down to those final decisions, there's a point where you have to say it would be irresponsible of me to take a student that is equally weighted against somebody that has a school that has a record of 96% versus somebody that has 56%. There's something going on at that school in terms of quality that is just not there and uh, we can't do it. And so what you see happening over and over again is that some residencies are very favorable to some schools. And when you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, well, what are my chances? Now we go to the next step with what are my chances at this residency? Okay. What you're also going to find is that when you are looking at a particular site, and I'll just pick two at random. Um, this one is uh, Brookwood Baptist Health, uh, and it's in the Deep South. And then I'll, I'll go to UNC. Um, so we see that this student's from Auburn. Um, next one is from Purdue. Next one is from <clears throat> Mississippi. And then the next one is from Auburn. And if you think of the Southeastern Conference, um, you know, you can see that three out of the, the four are from there. But 
when you look at this, there's kind of two aspects to this. The first thing is that you are more likely to get a residency if you are local, if you've had an appy with them, because in many places they, they want to hire you. Uh, they, they want you to continue your work there and, and it's more likely that's going to happen if you're, you're from there. Um, what I usually see with kind of the, the top national uh, residencies um, like the you know UNC acute care, um, you're going to see as you go through this that I want to say three of them were from UNC, but then the rest of them are from top schools and you see like Purdue, St. Louis Cop. Um, one was undergrad Michigan, I think UNC uh, and so on. And you got to dig a little deeper. Um, but others, you know, like I remember the VA in Florida is one that takes a lot of University of Florida the students and kind of continue on. And the VA is a lot of times special that if you've done a uh, rotation there, You've kind of gone through the process of getting into the VA system, and, and that's a big deal, too. So let's kind of go back to uh, the, the whole kind of um, idea here. What are your chances? OK, so the question isn't what are the chances of a pharmacy student getting a pharmacy residency? The question is, what are your chances? And so you can't change the school that you went to, but you can be aware of your NAPLEX score and your pass rate. If your NAPLEX scores are high and your pass rates are high, um, then you may have a little edge that you didn't realize that maybe you had. If they're a bit lower, then you realize that you're going to have to, and maybe you're even explicit about this, like, look, I'm very aware of the NAPLEX pass rate at my school. I wanna tell you that that is not gonna be an issue these are my credentials. This is how, you know, what I've done in my, um, you know, academics and so forth. And you can address it right away. Um, and, you know, they may even go far as to say, no, no, don't worry about that. That's not something we take into account. Uh, but I assure you that it, it has to be uh, because it's just irresponsible to, to try to hire someone that is not going to be able to pass the certification to actually do the job that's budgeted. You, it's just such a waste. Um, so, let, let's go to back to the match trends. Um, we are seeing a, a little bit smaller group is going to apply probably this year than last year. We're going to see maybe a little bit of a raise in the number of uh, residencies uh, than before. Um, the, the big drop doesn't happen uh, for another uh, year or two where the line should cross. That is, there's more residency positions than people looking for them. Uh, and then most recently, the number of pharmacy students is actually going up. Um, so it kind of bottomed and now it's bounced a little bit. Um, but it, it really won't affect you. So anyway, the, the big thing is um, for you to know that the, the first step is to apply to the right place. And applying to the right place means you're spending time with your letter of intent, not just getting it done but taking the time to see what's a place that really matches what you've done. So it should be pretty clear from your CV, like I'll look at a CV and in, in 10 seconds, I should be able to say, oh, that's an ambulatory care. That's an acute care. That's gonna be managed care. That's gonna be like, it should be pretty clear. And then in the LOI, you make sure that you make the argument, hey, you know, this is how we match and I'm prepared for these rotations. These are going to be exploratory for me. These are going to be electives uh, and, and you kind of go from there. So uh, again, I do wish you the best, but the, the best three things that you can do to increase your odds are one, uh, put time into the letter of intent and cover letter, not just as a document, but as a reflection of where you should be going. Two, make sure you're applying to places that take students from your school. And if you're you know, applying from the West Coast to the East Coast or East Coast to the West Coast, if you see all people from the same school, it's probably likely that they're just happy with the people that they have. And you're, you know, you're drawing dead. I mean, maybe you'll get an interview, but it's less likely that, that you'll get in there. And then uh, the last thing is, really be honest about where your school is in terms of you know its quality as seen by NAPLEX and MPJE and um, rates from last year if you're if you're past if your um, residency match rate is very high then you know you can have good confidence in it but if it's pretty low you're going to need to do a lot of extra work you're going to need to do a lot of extra applications and you're going to need to do a lot of relationship buildings to 
get that residency in spite of your school rather than because of your school. So it's not nice to say, I get that. But uh, again, we want to be realistic and we want to make sure that you get to where you want to go. So anyway, hope this uh, pre-holiday um, thing was helpful. I think that, again, most people are going to get a residency, but this is not the year to just get a residency. This is the year to spend a little extra time and get a little bit of extra quality of life. Um, every battle is won, won and lost before it's ever fought, and uh, you can win this residency battle um, before it's ever fought by creating significant quality. This has been the Pharmacy Residency and Money Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. You might want to check out our available residency audiobooks at pharmacyresidencypodcast.com forward slash books, or you can get your first book free if you've never been on Audible before. You can work one-on-one with me to get a better residency that will better suit your career, health, and wealth at residency.teachable.com. Feel free to send an invite to Tony PharmD on LinkedIn or email me at tonythepharmacist at gmail.com. Music was by Policy.